All right, so you are in the car right now. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so please explain what's happening. So yeah, I mean, the cool thing about the Micarino is you've got two seats next to each other very comfortably. So you've got a seat bench. So it's really cozy, especially if you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend uh, next to each other. So uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite, quite a close feeling. But still, it's enough space to fit two adults. And I think that's, the, that's a great thing. And you have the front door. Uh, with a soft close, so it's normally you park perpendicularly and you get out actually directly onto the sidewalk. So you can use a very small parking space and get out directly onto the sidewalk. Other than that, of course, um, it's got it, it's reduced to the max, so it's very simplified. But it's got basically everything you need. It's got the speedometer with a with a nice uh, user interface. We've got heating and so on. Exactly, I can close it. Yeah. So yeah, if I close it. There is a soft close, so it's also nice. You don't need to slam the door, it's just a soft close. We've got USB ports here, USB-C, USB-A, so you can charge your... Because people put their phone and that's like the entertainment yeah, system, right? exactly, you've got your phone. Normally we put, we don't have it here, but normally we have a Bluetooth uh, speaker, a portable uh, Bluetooth speaker that you can just take out of the car. For example, if you want to go to the... If you want to go listen to music near a lake or whatever, you can just take out a Bluetooth speaker. We don't have it here because usually at shows it gets stolen. But um, yeah, so it's super simple. I think what's also neat is we've got a sport button. So you have a, a you have a little button here with a Michelino and there's a rocket on top, and uh, you know you you get a little more power. So that's quite a quite a fun sort of um, thing. And yeah, other than that, it's super easy. I mean, it's drive, it's, it's of course only uh, forward and reverse, so you don't have to do any gear shifting. How nice is that sunroof? That's super nice. So that's, in summer, that's just fantastic. Uh, so yeah, you can really easily open and close it. So I close it now and then. Uh, the sunroof is default on all. Yeah, I mean, we do, we do offer the coupe version, but I have to say at the moment, we only produce with the sunroof. And it's also what's really requested by customers. It's just nice. It's just nice. Nice. But not allowed to stand on the seat and, and stand out the sunroof, right? The regulation. Uh, I mean, this is depends on the country and okay. how I would say probably the more south you go in uh, Europe, uh, the more, uh, the higher the chances that you're allowed to do that. <laughs> how easy is it to get in and out? It's pretty easy. So it's a different experience than a normal car. So you need to sort of know how to do it. But we have just a button here behind this bar, so you don't see it, but you just press it. And the door opens automatically. And usually what you need to do is you just need to scooch over. You've got a little handle here. So that will help you to get out. And you go out and that's it. And then you can just slowly close the door. You have a nice soft close and that's it. Nice. Um, what are some of the stories? Do you have the Swiss president riding it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think tomorrow there is a Swiss president coming and we hope he will sit inside. Does he have one? Um, yeah, he, he have, would be nice. The government nice. have some? Would be nice. Yeah, we are working with the government because it's a new category. It's not usually in their list of, let's say, potential things that they can buy. So we are working on that. No, but I think what's interesting, one of the first owners was a former CEO of Gucci. So it was one of the very first owners. Uh, we've got quite a few other, let's say, interesting customers that we cannot name because that was sort of... Uh, Kanye thing. West. I'm just joking. Yeah. No, no, not him, not him. But we've no, got he's got a Cybertruck. We've got some interesting, uh, some interesting celebrities and also other brands because there are also more and more companies that say they want something like that for their corporate sustainability. So, yeah. How do, how do they put the logos on? Are there special ways to do it? Just put a sticker? Yeah, I mean, it depends. Sometimes we help them, right? Yeah. You, you know, you can put a nice sticker on it. There are different possibilities. I saw there was food delivery. Yeah, uh, yeah. In yeah. some places. I think, yeah, it really depends. So we've got a lot of small, medium businesses also that see it as a great sort of sympathetic way to, you know, do their, do move around, but also have something that, you know, is representative, is nice, is sympathetic. So how safe is it to drive? So in terms of safety, we, of course, tried within the limits that you have in this weight category to, to, to make the best possible. So we are the first ones to actually have a, a unibody structure. So it's a real, so, so for those of the, the viewers who don't, let's say, know too much about car engineering. So 
Um, normally these vehicles are built more like a motorcycle. Motorcycles are basically metal tubes and you put plastic around. So that's how a motorcycle is built. This is stamped steel. So this is how a real car is built, right? And of course, in terms of safety, this is much better. We've got crash bars front and rear that absorb the, the energy. Where are the crash bars? Yeah, these are the, these are the crash bars. Of course, it's a shorter crumble zone. Yeah. So the, the, the strategy you apply with such a small vehicle is that it's a very stiff cage. So, um, so you, you, you just have a very stiff, stiff uh, integral cage. So, and we are the first ones using that in that category. So overall, I would say, of course, it's a new category. It's much, much, much safer than any bike, motorcycle, whatever. Of course, it's not exactly the same level as a real car, but I think that is uh, also not what anyone expects. It's just also much smaller and lighter. As I remember, the Smart 4 2 had the kind of an uh, impressive uh, safety record. They somehow, it, it needs to not they mean, they tumble made around and yeah, stuff they like made that. A are you able to do that, all, all yeah, these I mean, things also? So there are different things. So the, so the Smart also has a unibody construction. The Smart is much heavier, eh? so they are not in the same category as we are. Um, more than double the weight. Yeah, something. it's more than double the weight, exactly. Yeah. But let's say the, the, the philosophy is very similar what we did here than with the Smart. Uh, what the Smart had an issue in the beginning was with uh, tipping over, so the so-called elk test. Now, we have less issues with that because at the time when Smart had that problem, that was during their launch, it was still gasoline, right? But in our case, the battery is on the underfloor. So all the weight is at the very bottom of the car. So you have, you've got super great handling also in curves and so on. So yeah, people are surprised like how fast you can go in curves and how stable it is on the street. It's quite a sporty feeling, it's nice. Sporty feeling, that's a, yeah, that's a go-kart feeling. It's a real go-kart feeling. Because uh, when you drive in a city, you know, you can't be going at 200 miles per hour. No. It's not gonna happen. No. So uh, the only feeling you can get is get fast when it's green. Exactly, and this is this is nice. I mean, from zero to 50, you're, you're super fast, um, you're nimble, it's fun to drive. It's perfect for the city, honestly. It's perfect for the city. Perfect for the city. So uh, all your two, three thousand users are having fun right now. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Honestly, no, no problems. Oh, how, how did, I'm sure you had to uh, have the revisions in the first bunch, right? Yeah, I mean, of course you have, um, and I think, but this is uh, this is not surprising. Of course, when you launch a new product, and this is for every brand, it's the same. Um, you have usually still some software bugs that maybe you didn't discover during testing. But I would say to a good part, we sorted them out and the ones that we still have, we are trying to solve. Um, and you can update them all with the software. Yeah, yeah. They so that's be not updated. like a hardware problem. No, it's not a hardware problem. And uh, no, I think honestly, we are quite satisfied with what we achieved. Of course, not everything is perfect from the very first car, but now we have produced two, three thousand cars. So we are much more stable in our process. So yeah. Because even the Tesla Cybertruck, people are saying that it's r uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's some kind of noises in the things. Don't Rattling. you have this problem? Yeah, I mean, at all, a little bit, or it depends also on the reference, right? Of course, the expectation probably for a Cybertruck is higher than for for a Microlino. Um, noise is always very very complicated, um, but I would say we are in terms of rattling, we are quite satisfied. Of course, the main challenge that we have in terms of noise is that you hear uh, the gearbox noise because it's very small, so you sit basically on the drivetrain, but for me, the gearbox uh, noise. Sorry, what, what do you mean by the gearbox noise? It's just a general drivetrain noise, a typical noise that an electric engine makes in connection with the gearbox because it turns faster. So it's um, and it's just this is what I would say the the main noise that you hear inside. But it's a constant noise. So it's not like it's just the sound of the vehicle. It's actually quite nice because you know it makes you feel like in a. You still, you still hear something. I think a lot of people, they complain with electric vehicles that you don't really hear anymore when you're accelerating. And because it's so small here, you still hear it's it. It's beep, actually quite nice. Like yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah. You have a but sort could of you a... take off that sound somehow? No, it's, this is... This it's is not going to be possible but to think... isolate it somehow? Or... No, no, no. But, but this is, I think it's, uh, it, it's nice because, you know, it gives you more of a feeling of actually driving. You know, you hear something, you hear when you accelerate. It's cool. Many electric cars are actually too quiet, I think. All right, cool. That's awesome. Uh, all right, so looking forward to uh, uh, before next Geneva Motor Show, you'll have a million in the 
Hopefully, hopefully. It can ramp up fast. Hopefully, yes. All right. Hi. Hello. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Oliver. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Microlino, um, which is what you see here on the stand. Uh, it looks so cool, and um, you have a lot of fans already, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've got a couple of hundred thousand fans on social media, um, so a lot of people really like the product. Uh, a couple hundred can order it already? Can buy it? Yeah, no. I mean, there we, we already sold a few thousand units. A few thousand? Yeah, a few thousand units in, uh, in Europe. So main focus is in Europe at the moment. Um, yeah, that's um, how do you get to millions? Ha, ah, that's a good question. Oh, do you have some discussions here? Do you need <laughs> just a bunch of money and that's it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a money question. Um, I think it's also a mindset question. You know, it's it's all about people need to rethink the way they move, and we think this is the perfect way to decarbonize mobility because in a way um, you can still keep your. Uh, your gasoline uh, big car for your long distance trips, but this you can use for your everyday trips. So w whether it's going to work, going shopping, etc. So it's perfect for that. And so that's the whole idea of the of the of the product to be a perfect, let's say, daily driver. And how about for people who live in the village, 1,000 meter up in Switzerland? Oh, it's no problem. Is it going to be strong enough to go yeah, up the mountain? Yeah, yeah, definitely. No yeah, problem. We are Swiss, so for sure, this uh, we made sure that they uh, can climb the hills. Did you ever have the idea of swapping the battery? Yeah, so we were thinking about it, but I can tell you why we don't think it's a good idea. So first of all, it's added cost. Secondly, it's, the battery is still significantly larger. Where's your battery? It's actually underneath the, underneath the car. So Under there? Yeah, so basically down here, you have a compartment where there is the battery. And so basically why it makes no sense is First of all, even if you can swap it, it's going to be super heavy. So like for a private user, unless you have a swapping station, it makes no sense. And swapping stations are expensive, building out the infrastructure. How heavy is it? Uh, the battery now, with the, including the plate, is more than 50 kilos. So it's, 50. Not, it's yeah. not something you want to you wanna lift uh, at all. So I don't think it's, it, I personally Could don't still think happen, it's an maybe? advantage. Maybe in if the future. If it's automated, you know? Yeah, if it's automated, but it, I think the complexity and the design constraints there are not to be underestimated. That's the main challenge. So one of the main reasons why I like the battery swap is because maybe you can save money on the battery if people don't have the full range, and then they can swap for a longer range when they go on a trip. And also, maybe in the future, two, three, five years later, maybe the battery is getting longer yeah. range, and then... You don't want to. You don't want to be. You know. You want your car to be future proof. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's that's why I like it. Yeah, uh, I, I understand the rationale. I think that's why it's appealing to quite a lot of people. However, I do think there are quite some constraints there, right? So swapping technology, it's very difficult. It's sort of you're sort of locked into a certain ecosystem, so that makes it challenging. There are design constraints. So our battery has a different size than a battery of. A, you cannot partner with Silence and use the battery. Yeah, the thing is, um, it's not the same shape, right? Performance-wise, it doesn't work yeah. because they have a lower performance, and also you need to have you need to put it somewhere where it's really easy to take out and put in again. Uh, okay. So then you have a worse center of gravity. So we think it's, and actually this is what we see with our customers, right? So nobody will sort of take out a battery and sort of carry it up their stairs to charge it at home. They will just not buy an electric car if they don't have a. A charging to, uh, if they don't have an electric plug at home. But in our case, you don't need a specific charging station. So just a plug is enough, and in four hours you have a fully charged. So your my car. dream is to see this car sell to millions of people, right? Yeah. And super affordable. Like people should just pay two, three hundred francs or euros per month. Well, this and is that actually, should be enough to have it. Is it possible? It's possible, yes. We start at 150 Swiss francs at the moment uh, in really? a leasing, yes. 150 a month? For how many years? Four. 48 months. 48 months? That's enough to pay for this? Yeah, I mean, usually it's a leasing. So basically then it, you don't own it after that period. It's like you can then either extend the leasing, buy it out of the leasing, or get a new car. Basically, but that's, that's my it. dream. You need to be able to, uh, 150, 200, own it. Yeah. You know? That will, and uh, that will... how, do you, how do you get, uh, are you planning to get the price? How low do you plan to get? I think, um, I think we are quite happy at the moment where we are. I think um, leasing is important because it's all about residual values and we need to also give the um, 
the banks, the trust that this, and this is what we strongly believe, that this will be very steady in residual value so that you can get an attractive leasing rate. And so that's, I think, the focus. I think it's more of a challenge of mindset. It's a mindset challenge. It's not a cost challenge. It's a mindset challenge. People need to rethink the way they move and say, hey, this is actually perfect as an addition to my big either electric or gasoline car as a daily driver and I can massively reduce my carbon footprint. So uh, you, you don't have it like in your, in your strategy plans to get to 5,000 euro, right? No, no, no. This is not in our strategy plans. What if there's like a billion dollar investment? Somebody comes and says, okay, I want to invest a billion, but you have to make it 5,000 somehow. Well, anything's possible with money. <laughs> anything's possible, right? Because uh, it's like the big priority for European politicians Swiss politician, everybody is saying like, hey, EV, EV, EV. So they, they need to put the money where their, the mouths are, right? Yeah, agreed. They need to and say, fact, hey, this how category, do we get bigger quantities? Yeah, and, and in fact, the problem is this quantity oftentimes, uh, this, uh, this uh, category oftentimes doesn't get uh, subsidies like a normal electric car because it's not a real car. So you actually don't get the subsidies that we, we should get, so. I think it's better than a real car. Absolutely, absolutely. I, but I'm you a, don't, you, you know, we need also the politicians to understand that. Uh, uh, so I'm not like an old person, I'm a little bit big. I, I'm still hoping that I will not be squeezing my, uh, the partner sitting in the car, right? Uh, how do you, how, how is the response for bigger people? Oh, it's no problem. No, problem. no problem. No, I think um, it, people are surprised how spacious it is. Um, and you have to imagine that most, most cars are usually only occupied by one person, and here you've got two, two spaces. And actually, even for two adult people, it's They're not quite, squeezed. No, not it's squeezed. fine. Not squeezed at all. It's so cool. Uh, I see the word light. Is that the announcement that they show? Yeah, exactly. So this is, so this is uh, the, so this blue version here is the Micarino light. This is a version that is limited to 45 kilometers per hour because we wanted to target other customers as well, because there are more and more young people that maybe never did a driver's license test, and, um, but they still want individual mobility. Maybe they move out of the city. And so that's perfect for them, right? They can move, they have individual mobility, they can move it, but they don't need to have a driver's license. Is it just a firmware? You can click something and it becomes like a normal micro uh, Unfortunately not. It's it a would different be nice, engine. but it's a regulator that doesn't allow it. So is we it, have to make it super secure. Is it a different secure. engine? Yeah, it's a, it's a similar engine, um, but um, you know, in theory, it could be possible to eventually do that, that you can just sort of upgrade it with a very, with software. The regular but the problem is it's it. from, a, from a regulatory point of view, it's not allowed. So we are not able to right build now. it in that way but, at right now. Maybe but I'm just future. wondering if it's the same engine, the same battery. Yeah, it's, it's it the is. same, uh, yeah. Okay. All right, because it would be nice if, uh, when the father drives it, it's a different speed than when the kid drives it. Absolutely. Some kind or of even, way to or make even that. Maybe, you know, maybe you cannot switch it from one day to the next, but maybe at least you can say um, relatively easy, you can go to the, to the motor ministry yeah. and they sign something and then you can upload the faster software yeah. and, and you're good. After you get your driver's license? Yeah, shit, exactly. So that would, that would really, that would really yeah. make sense. And we are actually fighting for it. But um, let's say politics is very slow. So it says light here, huh? Is yeah. it light price or no? It, so the price is, is relatively similar. So it's a bit less than the, the normal uh, Microlino, but it's, it's quite similar uh, in terms of pricing. Um, as I said, we start in Switzerland, we start from uh, 149 Swiss francs a month. But that's amazing. Like, that's who, would say, who would not want to have that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is you cannot make enough, right? Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. how, how, uh, how uh, because I imagine it must be fun place at your factory right now in the last few months, uh, last couple of years. But how do you, you just, there's the people who want to buy. So you just ramp up. Yeah. How do you do more? It's, but of course you have to be careful that you ramp up in a, in a sustainable way, right? It's important to keep the quality. Um, you know, you have to keep your processes under control. You have to make sure that your suppliers can also follow because sometimes there might be the suppliers that are the bottleneck. So yeah, it's uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. Okay, <laughs> I don't know how it works to do real stuff, right? I just do YouTube videos. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think everything is hard if you want to do it professionally. Uh, it's just. Nothing like you get uh, Is your background? So you you working with your brother? Yes, correct. correct. And and it's like father. a family project. Yes, it's a family project. We actually we presented the Macarena for the first time here in Geneva. Can you introduce your father? 
Yeah, he's just uh, doing he's another there, right? video. I think. And your brother? My brother is here. This is my right brother. Who's really in charge? Who's really in charge? Me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, we are all in charge. I think we, we divide a bit. I'm more in, uh, responsible for production, development, supply chain. My brother more for sales and marketing. And our father is sort of the chairman overseeing more the general strategy. It, it's so cool to do, like make a car company, right? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's many years. Cool. It's many years. Yeah, it's cool and it's also a little bit crazy to do it. We are in uh, Geneva Motor Show 2024. Yeah. And you announced this? 2016. It's eight years ago. Eight years ago. That's correct. two World Cups. That's, it's that's a long two time. World Cups, yes. Uh, so, so it's like uh, just hard work getting investors, getting the partners, getting the... Yeah, it's, it's super hard for everything because, you know, you have to build everything from scratch. So the, the challenge is that if you start new, you have to build every process, you have to hire every, every for every position, you have to convince suppliers that they should work with you, which is not easy in this segment. Um, not easy in this yeah, segment. Not easy in this segment. So, um, yeah, it's challenging. I mean, we're still 100% self-financed, so it's a family, pure family company. Um, of course, down the road, we are looking to have uh, outside investors as well to further grow. But, yeah, so... What if these guys were no... What if the BYD comes and says, OK, let's, I want, we want it big. You can always talk. We are always open for anything. <laughs> because Europe uh, has a history of being in a, a very industrious uh, continent with a some very big factories and some are more or less busy in the last few years but maybe new project can make them super busy absolutely yeah i think i think i mean we manufacture in italy so we're a swiss company but we manufacture in italy so we like uh, the fact that we produce in europe it's important but of course europe also needs to change a bit the bureaucracy the bureaucracy that was built up because it's not so easy anymore to make uh, to to build up a factory in Europe. It's quite challenging, in fact, so. What are the challenges? No, many. Um, you know, so it's a lot of tax uh, challenges, bureaucratic, you know, just founding a company, making sure you can buy parts, VAT, reclaiming VAT. All this stuff is, you know, important for your working capital. You have to sort of say you know you have to be very detailed with transfer pricing how do you which price do you invoice to which company uh, the labor laws are very strict so it's just more challenging especially if you start a new project it's very challenging europe is over regulated in many ways unfortunately it seems the us and all these startups and stuff they very quickly become uh, unicorns and um, some of them crash they come big and stuff they just try and it's it seems in europe the people are much more careful it's much that easier they... to try in the US. Um, so there are several reasons for it. Of course, one is a cultural mentality that, of course, drives everything so that it's a failure is not seen as such of a problem, much of a problem. Then, of course, there is a lot of capital. So there is really capital that they're willing to invest to, to push. And also, let's say it's a very company friendly regulations, right? So in terms of labor regulations, etc., the US is maybe hard, I would say. But it's flexible. And that, of course, means you can take big risks. If in, if in Europe, uh, so let's take a supplier that says, you know, this is a huge thing. I need to hire 100 people uh, so that I can serve, uh, serve this market. You know, they're going to think twice about it because they know that if it doesn't fly, it will be a challenge for them to restructure their workforce again. So that's the reason why it's so much harder to, or one of the reasons why it's so much harder to build fast in Europe. So you are Swiss, right? Yes. So Swiss people are relaxed, right? They never, never stress too much or has I would, it been stressful times? Yeah, it's very stressful. I would say so Switzerland in terms of, because I work now also with other European countries, mm, the Swiss are very pragmatic and, it's, uh, and since it's not in the EU, it's much less bureaucratic. Eh? It's much easier to do business in Switzerland uh, than in the other European countries. Um, and the Swiss are very pragmatic, so it's very solution oriented. You know, it's not a lot of big talk. You sort of like when you talk with someone, you know what, where you're at. So it's and easy. How big is your team? Yeah, so we have a bit more than 100 people. Um, however, you have to see that usually the complexity of such a project requires that you work with a lot of experts. 
And in our size, usually you don't hire the experts, but you sort of use consultancies or external firms that sort of give you the necessary expertise to develop the product and to improve the product, etc. You get certifications in every single thing. Yeah. And some people know how to pass the test. Yeah, or yeah. Or like, uh, I guess. Yeah, I mean, for example, you work with a specialized company to get the vehicle registration to vehicle homologation so that you can be street legal. So you work with a company specialized on that that can help you to say, look, you have to do this, 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 and this to sort of apply to the European rules, so yeah. And uh, so in, in your team, in your uh, gr uh, groups of engineers and, and stuff like that, people don't get nervous that, uh, you know, if there's a problem and they, they, they're just honest about it and say, this we need to fix, you know, like, and they don't stay quiet for six months until somebody say, why didn't you say something? But I was like, I didn't want to, you know, like uh, if finding a solution, uh, like you say, pragmatic. Um, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, I think it's, it's coming down to a lot of the older um, companies, the older automotive companies. It was still a very old management style. So it was sort of management by fear also. And so of course, when you manage in that way um, and you're sort of punishing people for errors, mistakes or bad news, of course, eventually the bad news don't travel anymore. And that's very important that this doesn't happen. And of course, it's always difficult. Always, everyone always wants to tell the good news, it is clear. And there's always, let's say, a negative bias towards the bad messenger, right? But uh, I think we are at a pretty good balance where, you know, we still, we have to bring the things, you always have to bring the stuff on the table and see how you can solve it. So I've been to China a few times. Yeah. And I do see that the, they have something called a mini EV. Uh, Wooling Mini EV and uh, some other brand, Leap, Leap Motors, mm -hmm. they're doing, and they're trying to get stuff like lower cost. How do you compare? How do you say um, it, it is like, because what is your target price, like uh, Euro? Yeah, so we sell, we start at around 17,000 Euros. Um, so how do we compare? So first of all, you cannot compare it that much because the, it's a different uh, category in China. So the Wooling is a different category. It wouldn't fit according to European regulations. Um, the European category, in a way, it's made that you have either cars or you have micro cars like this one here. And here there is a very stringent weight limit of 450 kilograms excluding battery, which is super hard to achieve. It's super, super, super light. I mean, most, most cars are significantly above a ton and some of them are even more than two tons. And in the US, you can go to three tons plus even. So it's super light, this. And that, of course, requires you to be smart in, in your design choices and so on. So you can't really compare it. I would say in terms of positioning also, what we... So, you know, there's always the people that think, okay, for a small car, I just want to make it as cheap as possible. But we did a different approach. We said the hurdle for people to ride these type of vehicles is not the price, because you can get also larger cars for a very good price nowadays. It is really the acceptance. It is that people accept and change their mindset and say, you know what, I take something smaller because it's more practical, I need less space, I need less energy, and I'm more sustainable. And this is the sort of idea. So that's why we focus a lot on design. It's a very design-led product. Um, nice finishing and so on, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so it's exciting. How about the Americans? They want to have it. Yeah, so surprisingly enough, there is huge interest from the US. Seattle, San Francisco, yeah, all of these places. Not, yeah, exactly. Of course, not everywhere in the U.S., Maybe. but the um, U.S. is quite big. So, so what do you do need... to get there? Um, so in the U.S., the regulations are a bit different. So as said, we have the two versions, so 90 kilometers an hour and 45 kilometers an hour. And in the U.S., we will launch the, only the 45 kilometers an hour. Why? Because that's just how regulations are in the U.S. And there might be in the midterm future that we will do a that we do a version that um, that has three wheels, because in the U.S. you have a three-wheeler category where you then can go faster. So it doesn't really make sense, but you know I didn't make the regulations, so we just have to. Play how, about, by the rules. how about selling in Asia? Yeah, there is uh, for sure interest in Asia. Of course, it depends on which markets. I think Japan has huge potential, but also their vehicle regulations are a bit different. So. I would say the challenge is always to see how much do you have to change in order to be able to, to sell it in that market. So that so, means oh. so that means you just uh, uh, that means you just hire some uh, experts in the Chinese market. They will help Absolutely. you to to uh, tweak it for that market and exactly. boom. 
Yes. Oh, and maybe they ask you to open a factory over there and boom, make a million more of them. Maybe. I don't maybe. know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> right? But I think the Chinese should more invest in Europe. So maybe they should think about working with you. I agree. No, and in fact, yeah. we are in talks with, with some of them. But um, yeah, I think Europe has a huge history of uh, industrial production and so on. There's big know-how. And you know, we have to also strengthen our industry, right? I mean, China or Chinese electric cars are so successful also because there were massive subsidies and the Chinese government has uh, been one of the big customers for the Chinese brands. So they sort of helped them also ramp up the volumes, made it difficult for European production to be exported to China. It's basically impossible. So, you know, you just need to, you need to make sure that the, yeah, the rules are the same. I mean, I, I, as, a, as a user, I, I don't hate subsidies. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely. like to get some uh, subsidized stuff. Uh, why not? Like, especially when everybody says EV is a priority. Uh, no, I think it's great. I, I think it's great. I, I think it's just important that so China also subsidized their specifically the brands in China so that they can grow there. And now, of course, they're coming very competitive with very competitive Europe should subsidize Europe. the Europeans. Yeah, agreed. And just go and say, how do we get from two or three thousand to two or three million by 2026 or something? You know? Yeah, it needs, it needs subsidies, both financial, but it also needs um, it also needs uh, things like smaller parking spaces, um, specific traffic zones where you can only go inside with smaller vehicles. So these type of incentivation, they could be financial, but also non-financial, where people will say, you know what, I really use a vehicle that is fit for a purpose um, because it just makes so much sense, you know, and not just in an ecological sense, but also for practical reasons, etc. And so you need to really... Uh, push that. And if you look at Japan, right, Japan has K-Cars. K-Cars is like a small car from Japan that is only sold in Japan, this category. And they make 40% of new vehicle registrations. Why? Because Japan just said, we want small cars because we don't have so much space and we incentivize it. And they incentivize it in a variety of ways and now it's 40% of uh, new vehicle registrations. So no, no tax uh, entering the city. There should be no fee to park. Yes. There should be free charging. And small specific parking spaces that small parking spaces yeah. that are only for these type of vehicles because that's easy that doesn't cost anything you just need to you just yeah. need some paint <laughs> and you make a small parking space uh, instead of a big one. Can you one. park on the? You can park perpendicularly with this on, one. On regular size parking? Yes, yes. It, it that's the idea. It barely comes out of the side, right? That's the idea, yeah. yeah. It's as long as a normal parking space is wide. Okay, had you already have some cities in Switzerland and elsewhere who say uh, free parking, free charging for these kind of cars? Yeah, I mean, not in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland is usually not a country that does a lot on subsidies, but for example, in Italy, in certain cities, you can park for free with this category. So it's quite nice. In Rome, I, it's so funny to walk around this. So many smart for two. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's crazy. all over the place. Yeah, yeah, but there, you know, this is another way of incentivizing, right? In, in Rome, what they said is, well, there's not really any parking spaces, and the rule is basically you can put your car wherever it fits. Of course, also that incentivizes smaller vehicles, because all of a sudden you say, well, if that's the rule, the smaller my car, the easier I can fit somewhere. So, you know, there's various, and actually there you see the principle applied with parking very well, right? It makes sense to go into the city with a smaller car because you find a parking spot. I was in, uh, for example, Copenhagen with my Smart mm -hmm. 2 and I was just parking purple and I was thinking it should be fine, but actually some some of these controller guys like they come and say no 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 like it's like different like it's not always it's, allowed. It's different everywhere. Usually the parking regulations are made in the cities and not in the country, so that's a, quite a challenge. Um, and also you have to imagine that the, the the police guys that are sort of controlling where you park, they're maybe not that in depth in terms of what is the actual regulation, right? So they see something that where they're not used to and there might be a nice guy saying, oh, well, that's fine. Or there might be someone who's not so nice and say, well, I'm not used to it. I better give it a fine. <laughs> All right. Ah, that's cool. Hey. So please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Wim Abot. I'm the father of Oliver and Merlin. My two sons, they are uh, doing this project and I have a lot of fun making this project with my two sons for the last uh, almost seven years. So uh, how do you get this idea uh, to get your sons to do that? Or was it their idea? Well, we had the, the idea actually together. There was an idea of how can we say that we are not making toys, 
Um, so we decided to make one car as a prototype to show on the toy show that these are vehicles so kids can go to school. And uh, so we uh, created the first prototype in, um, in China. And uh, now we are producing um, all these cars in Italy. Already over 3,000 cars are produced and sold. Uh, how is it different creating a prototype and creating mass production? Oh, uh, That's eight years different? Oh, uh, the, the prototype is very easy. Everybody can make a prototype. Very easy. It's absolutely easy. But to go into mass production and to have happy customer, that's a big, big step. And uh, we have a lot of happy customers out there. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in business anymore. And uh, we are still improving, of course, because we, are, we all have to learn, because we are not making cars since 50 years, like other, others are doing. And uh, it's a great learning, and I think timing couldn't be better, because if you want to reduce CO2, you have to move to smaller cars. Don't electrify an SUV. It's absolutely stupid, no. Use smaller cars for a daily distance. And optimize the whole design around electric car. Absolutely, and we also don't need expensive uh, charging station. You need a normal socket where you load your iPhone. Uh, so the infrastructure is also very simple with these cars. Can you talk again about the prototype? How do you, you said you went to China? Was it in Shenzhen or? Uh, I forgot, somewhere in the middle of, of and nowhere. And with some uh, guys who could help you with the components to try to test different shapes no, and no, stuff? No, no, they didn't happen at all. No, no the opposite. How I do mean, you design the shape and everything? No, I mean, the design, everything was done in, in Switzerland. We had our, our designers. And uh, then afterwards, when you do the prototype in China, it was uh, just with existing components they had on the shelf. So it was not... Ah, this guy needs to open the car. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, can you int uh, introduce your sons? Yeah, Merlin. Hey, how are you? Oh. All right. Oh, sorry. And um, they take care of all the business? Yes, they take care of the business. Merlin, uh, Merlin was in, in China and doing the prototype. And how this was, was how many years ago? This was 2015. 2015. So he was about 20, 20 young. 20 very young. I, was, uh, I think I was 19, something okay, like that. Okay, 19. Yeah. I sent him to China with 19, making a prototype. Was it the first time you went to China? No, I was already in China uh, when I was maybe 16. 12, 13, yeah. Oh, yeah, 13, yeah. 13, yeah. We went to, to well, see the my, factory. I think it was my second or third time uh, to, to China. Yeah. But, I mean, I was, we were. Um, uh, yeah. we, we did it in. Uh, we did it in. Um, in, uh, it, the city was called Jinhua, so it was a bit in the north of, uh, of China. And uh, I mean, that's really China because people are not able to speak, uh, uh, let's say, English. So you're really, um, yeah, in the more Chinese traditional uh, areas. And uh, is it a fun uh, family uh, or do you, <laughs> it's like, it must be fun to work on something like this. Yeah, absolutely. I and, mean, but we also don't know, I mean, this is what we know, right? Uh, so we were very used to that. It has certainly a bit of special dynamic because it's, uh, we are on one side uh, a family like any other and on the other side we have, let's say, the business together. So I think um, we, share, we share a lot of time with each other, which is good, uh, and a lot of, let's say, understanding, of course. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's always fun. <coughs> and when you grow the team, it's like growing the family also a little bit. Yes, of course. Um, that's also uh, a thing, right? Everyone uh, apart from that. But I would say there is a difference between related with blood and related with, let's say, the same company, of course. That's so how the, is the role? How do you define the role? What you do and what your brother does? So I'm personally more responsible for the sales and sales expansion. So we're, we, were, um, we expanded quite quickly into different uh, European markets. Um, and the marketing a bit, so those are, let's say, a bit more my topics. Um, when also it comes a bit to design, let's say, not that I'm, let's say, designing the car, but like certain like um, product uh, choices, um, I'm more responsible for that. And my brother is a bit more on the uh, production side and a bit more on the financial side. Um, but at the end of the day, we work very hand in hand. So it's not very strict, but that's usually how we split up. What does your also. father do? 
And our father, he's, um, let's say, more on the strategic level. So operationally, he's not, let's say, involved that much. But on a strategic level, when it comes about big decision, uh, production, uh, production decision, product decisions, etc., he's, of course, involved. So it's his little baby as well. Do you have other brother and sister? Nope, that's it. We're uh, the, how about the your mom? Us. She's, uh, let's say, the CFO of, uh, of Micros, so of our uh, family company for the scooters. And um, yeah, this is, this is where so she's So everybody's involved. involved. Yeah, she's actually the big boss because she's uh, taking care of the finances, of course. So you say sales, right? Yeah. Uh, and I was talking with your brother before and I was like, um, I really would like to see uh, millions of these soon. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, soon is uh, maybe a very hard term, but uh, we're working on it for sure, yeah. And we were talking about the U.S. market, the, Ch the Chinese market, other Asian markets, and you're thinking about everything. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I mean, we also have to focus a bit on the on our, let's say, a bit short-term goals, and that is certainly the U.K. Um, quite soon. And um, yeah, I said uh, the U.S. We believe you have a huge potential, but we need to work step by step. I saw the fully charged guy. Yeah, and he said it's his favorite car ever, kind of. That's yeah, what he Jack was saying. Yeah, Scarlett. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, hey, uh, I mean, uh, you should be able to sell. Yeah, yeah. Hundred thousand cars in the U.K. Yeah, absolutely. Why yeah, not just be, like uh, the U.K. will be a very, very interesting market. I wouldn't be surprised if it will be uh, our number one market, to be honest. And uh, we were also talking with your brother about the leasing. Yeah. Only 149 Swiss francs per month. Yeah, that's the beginning, or that's yeah, that's the starting price. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, what does it mean, For, starting? Uh, that means, let's say, with a small battery uh, and uh, the Micronino light, so to speak, and it's uh, leasing with uh, 48 months and uh, a down payment of 25 percent. 25 percent. So, yes. uh, 4,000 something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. And uh, if if you go 250, 200, something, what what are the conditions? You you get. Uh, I mean, you can just let's say upgrade for maybe the medium battery, for example. Uh, so it depends what kind of options you you uh, you choose on your vehicle. After the four years, you need to pay extra to keep it, right? Um, I mean, after four years, you can buy it out of the leasing, of course, or you can opt for a new leasing and uh, exchange it with a new Microlino, for example. Or continue using it? No. Or continue using it, yeah. If you yeah. pay, let's say, the residual value, uh, you can keep the car. How's it going in the winter? Um, actually, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a winter car, but it drives fairly uh, good in snow um, due to the, let's say, very narrow tires as well. And um, yeah. Does it get uh, cold in there? We have a heater, so... Uh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. And do you defrost, defreeze the windows? Yes. So we have a heated uh, rear windshield and the front windshield we defrost with, um, let's say, the, the vents. Exactly. The vents. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.